In 2020, blood donor organizations in Ghana went through the most difficult period of mobilizing the life-saving commodity. The volatile condition that existed was worsened by the COVID-19 pandemic, which triggered imposition of restrictions in some parts of the country. Not even the gradual lifting of the restrictions eased the struggle of the blood bank officials and donor organizations to attract donors in their efforts to replenish and maintain stock. Even before the COVID-19 virus hit Ghana, the country's blood stock was already under intense pressure due to a number of factors hesitancy on the part of the public to donate this essential commodity was one key challenge health workers were grappling with. Francis Kobla Gadu is a security officer whose wife was scheduled to deliver on November 13, 2020 at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital here in Accra. Prior to this, Francis had serious misgivings about blood donation. Today, I went to the hospital with my wife. And then during the doctor's interview, he asked whether we have donated blood for her to be able to deliver. We said no. Then she said she should come to Kalebu and, do, uh, and donate down for her delivery. So that's why we came to deliver. If not for that, you wouldn't have come? No, 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 no. no. I won't come. Why? Mm, the first two I donated, a family of mine was sick. When I took the car to the hospital, we were turned down. We had to donate again. So I saw it not to be necessary. So I don't donate. In Ghana, there's a high blood scarcity as the blood banks are not able to collect enough to meet the demand. To replenish its blood supply, the country heavily depends on family replacement blood donors instead of voluntary blood donors. For example, in 2017, Ghana collected a total of 162,226 units of blood, of which only 36% was from voluntary unpaid blood donors, whilst the rest, 64%, was family replacement donors. The family replacement system is where relatives of people who need blood are asked to donate before the patient is served. This has far-reaching consequences on healthcare delivery because patients who cannot find relatives or friends to donate blood for them during emergencies such as bleeding from complications related to pregnancy and childbirth, severe child anemia, patients suffering sickle cell disease, victims of trauma, etc., may not recover from their condition. Dr. Frederick Quating is head of the Accident and Emergency Center at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital. We rely largely on MBS, large national blood transfusion services. The, the Accident and Emergency is the country's biggest uh, emergency center. We receive the highest number of emergencies of all sorts, either medical and then uh, surgical emergencies and trauma victims. The medical emergencies themselves consume a lot of blood because most of them come in very anemic, needing blood transfusion. And then the accident victims too in our center receive a lot, they consume a lot of blood because all the big, all the hospitals in Accra, once victims of accidents are sent to, they will be referring to Kolebu. Every bad injury will be referred to them uh, uh, because uh, most of them are not equipped to manage such cases. And some of them have bad injuries, multiple injuries, uh, head injury, chest injury, for which you need expert care in Kolebu. So it, we are a high cons uh, blood consuming environment. With the pandemic disrupting blood donation services, Dr. Quartin said he and other medical officers had to devise other means of saving the lives of their patients. Uh, our surgeons are here 24 hours and we do everything to ensure that as much as possible we have low mortalities on our hand. In most of these cases, we will require blood to save their life. However, if we don't get the blood, we try as much as possible to use other means, such as uh, giving them 
hematenics, you know, to boost their hemoglobin, and then also perform surgeries on them for which we make sure they don't bleed a lot. I must say that for majority of them who needed blood to save their life, we were able to sail them through without losing uh, most of them. Even though uh, blood being available would have made life easier for us. But we did not give up. We did not have the required number of blood products around. However, we managed to get them better. Hematinic is a nutrient required for the formation of blood. The main hematinic are iron, B12 and folate. Deficiency in this is a major cause of anemia, particularly in pregnant women and lactating mothers. In Ghana, the National Blood Service, NBS, has never met its annual target of 300,000 units of blood. Stephen Adai Ba is the public relations officer of NBS. The National Blood Service has always projected to meet the target of uh, 300,000 units of blood every year, which is about 1% of the population of Ghana. So we project that if at least 1% of the population donates blood, then we should be able to at least achieve about 300,000 units of blood. That will save the entire uh, country. But unfortunately, we've not been able to meet that target. We have always done less than 50% uh, oh. of our annual projection. However, in the first quarter of 2020, what looked like an improvement over previous year's performance was eroded by the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, for the first um, quarter in 2019, we are talking about, no, yeah. 2020. 2020. Right. Um, so first quarter, we were able to achieve about 57%, wow. 57% of our target, wow. which is the half of the 300,000 units that we projected. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So I think that it was quite good. Yeah, then they, they, it was promising that at least we would have done better in the second quarter and beyond. But for, for COVID, we, we were not able to. Many healthcare institutions rely heavily on the NBS for blood donation drives. To avert a further worsening of the situation, the National Blood Service had to implement some tough measures. The approach is that you know, because of the COVID situation, uh, most of our regular donations were cancelled. And, you know, we get the chunk of our donations from the schools, the second cycle schools, the churches, uh, the organized groups, and also the corporate organizations. But you know that uh, almost all of these organizations were affected by the restriction. Measures that we put in place was to make sure that we do a call up of our donors so we look through our database those who are you know due to donate we call them and then uh, we came into an agreement with the ministry of health and then the security agencies to prepare a, a pass kind of you know, during the restriction period, the lockdown and all that, people were not allowed to go out and things like that. Uh -huh. So by the kind generosity of uh, the Ghana Health Service and then the security agencies, we put up a card system, like a security card system. So when we call you, we either send it to you via WhatsApp or you go through the security check system. During this pandemic, the NBS has come to rely more and more on the family replacement system and has intensified its efforts in this. The family replacement system is such that if your, 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 your relative is in need of blood, definitely you have to bring people to come and donate before your patient you know, uh, is, is served. Uh -huh. So that was what really helped us. And other facilities, you know, the, most of the facilities will come here for blood 
also have a, a system to get the family replacement system done at their facilities. Uh, so a lot of them rely on that family replacement system. That was what saved the, the situation. Had it not been that, it would have been a very uh, serious and difficult time for, for, for Ghana. The demand for blood transfusion is high in Ghana, like many other African countries. This is because of the high prevalence of anemia, especially due to malaria and pregnancy-related complications. In the country's capital, one of the major referral health facilities, the Greater Accra Regional Hospital, is reeling under the impact of this pandemic. According to a 2020 report on maternal and perinatal data at the hospital, obstetric hemorrhage accounted for the leading cause of maternal mortality, representing 44.8%. This means about five out of every 10 maternal deaths at the facility could have been prevented if there is sufficient blood at any given time. Dr. Emmanuel Stropanyo is the medical director. So you can see that a hospital of this stature, that is, we deliver about 700 women to every month, sometimes 800, and this is what we have. This is not enough. Dr. Shropenyo further highlights the severity of the situation at his facility. He believes most of these women would have been saved if adequate blood had been available at that critical time. Of all the things that women go through in motherhood, at the point of delivery, that is the most difficult and the most painful part of the entire motherhood process. And to add injury to insults, there are some women that at the point of delivery, after they have delivered, then they begin to bleed and bleed and bleed. The medical system has medications and procedures that we do to stop the bleeding. However, there are some of the women who do not respond properly to these medical procedures. So they bleed and bleed. Sometimes we have to then go to theater and remove their womb. Assuming she came for the first child, and then you have to remove the womb. And then imagine what this woman will go through. And sometimes you do all these things, and the woman may still lose her life because you did not have adequate pint of blood in your blood bank. Mm. I have been to conferences where people come to present their experiences, and they say that this woman's life was saved with 40 pints of blood. But oftentimes, we don't have that amount of blood to give to one person. We may have about 40 pints of blood, but maybe for the whole hospital, all the patients who are coming to this hospital have to share in that. But in some no, other areas, comes. there are adequate amounts that any pint of blood that you need mm. to save a person is available. Mm. And so in those countries, death as because of hemorrhage for a woman is very minimal. Despite this challenge, the medical team here has put in place some measures to curb maternal deaths as a result of obstetric hemorrhage. It is difficult to predict who would deliver and bleed. What we do is that once you are pregnant and you come to our hospital to book, we encourage you to inform your family members to come and donate blood for you ahead of time. And when, you, when the blood is donated for you, you'll be given a treat which will be added to your antenatal booklet. So when you come in labor, then the information is there that you have donated one or two pints of blood. However, we are a referral hospital. There are people who attend antenatal clinic at various places. During labor, they are bleeding. They may have delivered bleeding. Or during labor, there is a complication for which they are referred to the regional hospital. When they come here, they have not donated any blood, but they may have a complication that in blood transfusion. And this is what put excess stress on our stock. So there may be people who have booked with us who may have donated blood. There may be other people who come as emergency who are requiring blood. So we are a regional hospital, we are a referral center. We receive patients from all over the place in the city. 
but we don't receive blood from all over the place from the city. In the midst of the pandemic, myths and misinformation surrounding blood donation and transfusion are greatly hampering the efforts of health workers to increase the country's blood stock. In Ghana, many people believe that blood is a precious and sacred substance common to families which should be preserved in the family and not donated to strangers. 28 years old Patience Nete is a university student I met at the National Blood Service. She is one of such people. And my cousin is pregnant, so they asked her to bring two people to donate blood. And I happen to be one of those people, so... Yeah. If not for that, you wouldn't have donated? No, I don't think so. <laughs> there are those who also believe that HIV tests would be conducted on them before their blood sample is taken. Dr. Shropanyo discounts the claim. Some people also fear that if the blood is taken, I might be diagnosed as HIV. And I want to assure the public, per national protocol, we don't do HIV tests before the blood is taken. All that we do is that the blood samples are taken, we put holes on them, and then later on, some of these tests are done. Unless, of course, the person himself I requests from the staff that he wants to know his HIV status. If you do not want to know, nobody is going to do any HIV test and then inform you that this and that is the issue. However, those tests will definitely be done on the blood sample. Those samples that we feel are contaminated will be discarded. Okay. So that is the process. There's also the category of people who are against blood donation and transfusion because of their religious belief. Janet, a senior nursing officer at one of the major health facilities in the country, recounts an experience she had with a patient who was brought to the facility very anemic. We have one case who needed blood, but fortunately not having the blood group, so we have to refer the patient to a different facility. It was within last year. It was anemia. It was really a severe and I think the age was 3.6. Even she didn't want to even take the blood. Why? She said she wants to go home and go and do her herbal medicine. Wow. She insisted, yes. So we made her write, the doctors made her write discharge against medical advice. But obviously, they still wrote a, a, a referral letter for her. I personally went closer to her. So I went closer to her. She was able to open up things to me. And she said for her belief, they don't take blood and other things. And then she believes when she goes home, she eats these green leaf vegetables and other things. She boosting her blood. Do you get some of these patients expressing similar concerns or beliefs like this patient? Even some of them come with a form written on it. No, they don't take blood. So they will insist you put it in the folder. Even if you are not around, someone comes and takes the folder. will know that they don't take blood. So as yes. a nurse, how, how do you manage those patients? Do you bother to educate them or why we they need... We do educate, but there is this thing that we know about nursing patients' rights. We will educate you. If you still assist, then we respect your rights. We don't force you. Apart from this challenge, she also laments how some family members desert their relatives at the facility because of their inability to afford the processing fee charged for blood. We have this client who needed blood, but the blood group, you know, we're not having some at our facility. So we need to go out. And there wasn't any relative to help to. It was very terrible for us. No relative was ab available to help. If we need to help crap, but the means was not there to go and get it at other facility. So what we're supposed to do is just give some uh, hematemics to the patient. Some of them, when they come and they say it involves money, when they go, they don't come back again. However, 
There are others who do not believe in the myths and misconceptions surrounding blood donation. 65 years old Delphinus Nodo is a retired teacher who has been donating blood for close to four decades. Delphinus has received national recognition since he started donating blood in 1981. Uh, personally, I didn't, um, I didn't think uh, my blood would go anywhere. In the first place, I mean, the blood service come and take the blood. Eh? They put it in their bags. Eh? And then from there, it goes to the hospital. And I don't think, I don't think they will go in maybe give it to somebody for ritual purposes or whatever. Because most of the time, a few times it happens that people come to you that, oh, you don't have, can you do this for me? You see. I remember one time there was a lady who was pregnant. And she went to the hospital, they wanted her husband to come and donate or something like that. But the husband wasn't around. I think he had traveled. So she came to see me now, oh, would you want to? Uh, maybe credit for me. I said, okay, well, why don't so, uh, so I accompany her. Yes. I went to the hospital and they took my particulars. And but that's crediting. So what they do is that they will take your certificate. And then in one of the leaflets, you write credited for so so and so. Yes. And that was all. And then she only went to, to the hospital to go and deliver. So real, in this case, they, they didn't actually take my blood, but it was they were using my certificate to credit for her. For Delphina Snodo, blood donation forms part of his Christian belief. Blood donation is, is, is the best thing you can do for somebody. You see, because uh, as a believer, as a Christian, the Bible tells us that the best thing to do is for one to lay down your lives for somebody. You see. So why not? The blood you are giving is going to save somebody. You know, yes, in this world where they are complete, when anytime there's war, people shed blood, you know. So I would say it's better to share your, your blood <laughs> than to shed it. Delphinos is not the only loyal donor. An officer with the Ghana Prison Service, Mary Martina Vumedu, says stories about the death of some pregnant women due to loss of blood motivated her to be a voluntary donor. When I was a child, I've been hearing that people lost their life during their ch childbirth. So when I grew up and I joined the service and I was at Kumasi Central, a female prisoner was sick and I decided to go and donate for her. And since then, I've been donating voluntary to the Brag Van at Kumasi. Another challenge faced by the NBS over the years is the existence of blood donor contractors. These people take advantage of relatives who require blood by demanding payments for blood donated. These contractors take advantage particularly of those who come from outside Accra who may not have anyone to donate blood on their behalf. They charge between 50 to 60 Ghana cities for each pint of blood they donate. But Public Relations Officer of NBS Stephen Adeba says they've put measures in place to ensure the perceived abuse of the system is curtailed. We don't monetize or uh, incentivize you know blood donation uh, it is strictly against who protocol that you don't have to entice people to donate blood so what it means is that when you don't give them anything it means that they won't donate blood and that will affect healthcare delivery uh, as far as blood transfusion is concerned and so Yes, we know that there are people in the system who usually would want you to give them money before they donate, but we did not encounter such, you know, people. And we've also educated our donors or patients that when you come or you're in need of blood, you don't have to rely on such people to donate blood for you because the safety of the donor and you, the recipient, you know, it's, it's, it's our concern. And so, the person you are contracting kind of to donate blood for you, you don't know 
his or her status. Do you get me? Uh -huh. And so we don't encourage people to go to search people to donate blood for them. And the other thing is that we've put measures in place whereby uh, those people can be identified because you are required to donate blood after every four months. And so if you donate blood today, then tomorrow because you have taken money and you want to donate blood, when you come, the system will, 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 wow. will, will, will find you out. He added that blood is not sold in Ghana, but patients pay a processing fee of between 50 to 200 CDs to cover expenses. Patients who cannot pay the processing fee but who urgently need a blood transfusion do receive one, but they must arrange to pay the fee at a later date. With the COVID-19 pandemic still affecting healthcare systems worldwide, a clear, proactive and consistent communication strategy is needed to addressing and overcoming donor anxiety and fear, which often stem from lack of awareness or misinformation. At the Greater Accra Regional Hospital, Dr. Shrofwenyu explains the hospital is making good use of the communication platform for blood facilities to manage the current situation. There is a system which we are implementing using WhatsApp platform so that when you need blood urgently, let's say you may have blood but you don't have a particular group. A patient comes who needs a particular group of blood. If we don't have it at that point in time, we can advertise on that platform for other sister institutions to see that, oh, we just put on a big group of blood. I have it, I'm not using it. Then we can make arrangements for that blood to be transferred to the Greater Accra Regional Hospital. We have those systems. Also, regular voluntary non-renumerated blood donation is a key component for any successful blood program. Donor retention is therefore important in further improving the safety and quality of the blood supply. But the fact generally is that no hospital has enough blood because we have not done adequate blood campaign until now. We have not been carrying out adequate blood campaign to bring the issue. In some countries, even in marketplaces, there are donation centers. So when you go to the supermarket, and you feel like, oh, today you want to donate, but you can just have the opportunity to donate. But we have not been aggressive enough. Mm. And that is why we want to now uh, come this aggressive mm. and want to make this a year-long discussion for it to become a topical issue. The producer of this report, Beryl Ernestina Richter, is a fellow of the Africa Women Journalism Project. This report is supported by the Africa Women Journalism Project in partnership with the International Centre for Journalists.